Hi everyone, I'm Jerry Schumann, pastor here at Ludlow Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this video blesses and encourages you in your faith. And please consider sharing this on social media. Doing so is a strategic way that we're able to share the gospel with other people today. But before we begin, please keep this in mind. This video is not intended to be, and really it cannot be, a replacement for your commitment to a local church. God commands his people to gather regularly for worship and for fellowship under the leadership and the care of godly elders where the whole body is knit together and that's how the body grows and builds itself up in love. So nothing online can be a replacement for that. So if you're in the area, uh, come and join us for worship. We'd love to have you with us. If you're not nearby, please be sure that you are committed to a local, faithful, Bible-believing church. Thank you, and God bless. Father, your word tells us that as we come to your word, that we are to come to the word as newborn infants who have put away uh, every vile and, and evil thing, malice, and so on. That we are to come to your word as newborn infants and long for the pure spiritual milk of the word of God. And so, Father, I pray that in everyone's heart here, including myself, that that would be our attitude. That, that we would view your word like a baby views its mother's milk. That we, we long for it, we cry out for it, we depend upon it. When we don't get it, uh, we are unsettled in our being. Uh, that we desire it earnestly. And your word says that by it, you may grow up into your salvation. So, Father, we want to grow up into sanctification. We want to grow in our most holy faith. We want to grow in our dependence upon Christ in faith. We want to be kept from the evil one. We want to be kept from temptations and trial and temptations. And so we pray, Father, that you might build us up and strengthen us by your word. And we pray, Father, that we might indeed grow in our most holy faith. So please bless our time today. May you be glorified in it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a few weeks ago, we concluded our study in 1 Samuel, and our plan is to continue on in the book of 2 Samuel. Uh, we we want to see how uh, David is pointing forward to uh, the greater son of David, Jesus Christ, uh, and David will ascend the throne in 2 Samuel. But before we do that, I thought it would be good for us to look at Philippians 1 today. So if you're turning to 2 Samuel, turn back to Philippians, if you would, please. We're looking at Philippians today, and if you don't have a copy of God's Word, there should be a Bible in front of you. I would encourage you to take that out and follow along as we're going through because we want you to see what God's Word says, not what I say. So today we're looking at Philippians 1 because this passage is very applicable to us as a church family with our present situation as a body of believers. The Apostle Paul here is living life with his own mortalities right mortality right before his eyes. He is writing this letter here to the church at Philippi from his prison cell in Rome in the year AD 62. And he's awaiting trial before Caesar, and he doesn't know if when he stands trial, if he's going to be sentenced to death, or if he might be released and he might be able to continue living. Death is right before him, the reality of death. And we, as a church right now, we are in the season where we are reminded of our own mortality. Tom mentioned this earlier, but uh, for those of you that are guests with us today, one of our, our church members, uh, our dear brother John, uh, he, he passed away this last Monday. Um, it was, John was with us six weeks ago, you might remember. And you might remember that at the end of the service, John did what I think is so precious. He started spontaneously singing, Praise the Savior, ye who know him, who can tell how much we owe him. Let us gladly render to him all we are and have. It's just six weeks ago. And this last week, he, he went to be with the Lord. And th this, is a, this is a reminder of our own mortality. Life is fleeting. God's word tells us in, in Isaiah, it says, all flesh is like grass, and all of its glory is like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Whether we're old or whether we're young, our life is fleeting. It goes by so fast. 
And we're not guaranteed to have a long life like John. We may have another day. We may have another month. And so one of the mercies that God provides when we lose loved ones is we are all reminded of our own mortality. And, and this, this is a blessing. God's word tells us in Ecclesiastes, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. Because this is the end of all mankind, and the living take it to heart. So this is one of the mercies God gives us when we lose the loved one. We rejoice in the hope of glory, and yet it's a reminder for us of our own mortality. Our life is fleeting. And how ought that affect, to affect, then, the way you live your life? Well, listen to how the, uh, the Apostle Paul answers this question with his own mortality right before his eyes. Look at verse 20. He says, As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul's great aim in life, in all that he did, whether he lived or whether he died, was that Christ would be honored in his body. There's a missionary C.T. Studd who said this, One life to live, twill soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. The Apostle Paul would say amen to that. One life to live, twill soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. And Paul saw his mission in life as living for the glory of God. That was the source of his joy. If you look at the end of verse 18, he says, Yes, and I will rejoice. Here's this man in prison. The reality of death is right before his eyes, and he is rejoicing. What's the source of his joy? It's verse 20. That with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul's joy was rooted in his desire and his pursuit in his life that Jesus would be glorified or honored or made much of in all of his life. What a different message from our culture. If our culture thinks about the brevity of life, which our culture doesn't often do, but if it does, what's its response? It doubles down on living for oneself. Uh, what's the saying? YOLO, you only live once. Life is short, live it up. Finish your bucket list. Live for yourself, self-gratification, self-satisfaction, live for self. That's what our culture says. And yet, as we see our culture so self-oriented, what do we see? We see a culture that is empty and is joyless. Isn't that what we see in our culture around us? As it's so self-oriented, it is empty and joyless. We see a culture around us that is filled with self-loathing, depression, midlife crises, addiction to technology, and to sexual desires, drunkenness. One of the highest rates for death for young people today is suicide. It's first, I saw one stat said first, another stat said second. But for 15, teenagers up through end of 20s, that's one of the highest reasons for death is suicide. And brothers and sisters, our joylessness is tied to our self-orientation. And if you are here today, and if you are discouraged and looking for hope, Hear the good news from the word of God. God did not create you so that you would find your joy living for yourself. God made you in his own image that you would find your joy in him. You were made to find your joy in the one who is your creator, in the one who laid down his life as a substitute for sinners that you might be reconciled to God, in the one who is the son of man who has received a universal dominion from God the Father in the one who is the Son of God who reveals to us the Father. And if you find your joy in Christ, like Paul, then what you're going to find is your joy is not going to be fleeting. It's not going to be dependent upon the circumstances in life. It's going to be like Paul's, where it's resilient. It doesn't matter what kind of affliction or trial you're going through, you're going to have a joy that abides. Isn't it amazing? Chuck, you mentioned... Where's Chuck? Chuck, you mentioned... Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. That's in the same book here. This is a man in prison. What kind of joy does he have in Christ that he can exhort other believers who have freedom? Rejoice! <laughs> it's amazing. So what I want you to see today is, is two truths about the pathway to life of true, lasting joy centered on glorifying Jesus in your life. Here's the first 
the first truth. You need help for a life lived for the glory of Christ. In order for us to live for the glory of Christ, we need help. This is not something that we can do on our own strength. And Paul knew this. So before he expresses his confidence in verse 20 that Christ is going to be honored in his body, he, noted, he acknowledges his source of help in verse 19. So look at verse 19 in Philippians 1. I'm starting at the end of verse 18. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. So here he mentions two avenues of support that this meaning his imprisonment, will turn out for his deliverance. And so the question we ought to ask is, what does he mean by deliverance here? Is, is he just speaking of a literal deliverance? He's in prison and he just wants to be delivered from his imprisonment and he'll have freedom. Is that what he's speaking of by deliverance? Well, that's possible because we see in verses 25 and 26, he does express confidence that he will remain alive and keep ministering. So that could be what he's referring to. But I think the way the Apostle Paul is using the word deliverance is in a, a, a spiritual sense, a spiritual deliverance, a spiritual rescue of the trial that he's in, that despite, despite the temptations of his trial and the pressure to renounce Christ, that he will be delivered from that and remain faithful to Christ. Let me give you two reasons why I think it's speaking of a, of a spiritual deliverance. First, the Greek word for deliverance, it's overwhelmingly used of a spiritual deliverance of salvation. And in, in fact, whenever the Apostle Paul uses this word, he only uses it in this way in every other example. So let me give you two examples in just the book of Philippians here. If you look down at verse 28 in chapter 1, he is encouraging believers not to be frightened in the face of opposition. And then he says, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation. The word salvation is the same word as deliverance in verse 19. Courage shows that you've been saved, that you belong to Jesus. That's speaking of a spiritual salvation. And then if you look at chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation there's that word again, with fear and trembling. That's speaking of a spiritual salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. So that's one reason why I think we, we are to take deliverance as a spiritual deliverance and not as being delivered out of prison. That's not what his joy is found in. The second reason is Paul tells us what's meant by spiritual deliverance in the next verse. So look at verse, start at the end of verse 19. He says, this will turn out for my, for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. So Paul knows he's going to stand trial for his faith in Jesus Christ. And there's going to be intense opposition for him to compromise, for him to renounce Christ, for him to deny Christ. And this is a trial. And, but he has confidence in the power of Christ in him that he will give him the power that he needs to be delivered from this trial and remain faithful to Christ whether he lives or whether he dies. Well, what's the help that is going to enable him to be able to do this? Well, he mentions two things. In verse 1, or in, uh, the first one is this, the prayers of other believers. He says in verse 19, through your prayers, this will turn out for my deliverance. Through the prayer of the church in Philippi, this is going to turn out for my deliverance. Through their prayers, Paul's confident that God's going to work to help give Paul the aid he needs to remain faithful to glorify Jesus. I think this is an amazing thing that Paul says because... Paul knows the sovereignty of God. Paul says in Ephesians 1, 11, he says, God works out all things according to the counsel of his will. G God is the sovereign over all, and he works out absolutely everything according to his purposes. And yet Paul says here, God is going to work through your prayers to help me that this will turn out for my deliverance, that I'll glorify Jesus through whatever happens. 
Paul knows that God works in his sovereignty through the prayers of his people. Look at another passage where Paul says something similar. Turn, turn forward to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 1. Or pardon me, turn backwards to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, look at verse 11. Second Corinthians 1 11. Look what it says. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. So Paul says there, help. God gives help through the prayers of others. At the end, he says God gives blessing through the prayers of others. In our passage in Philippians, it says God gives deliverance through the prayers of others. Our God sovereignly works through the humble, meager prayers of his people. You remember in Exodus 17 that Israel was engaged in the battle with the Amalekites, that they're fighting with the Amalekites. And as they're fighting down in the, in the valley, Moses is up on the hill. And there he's having his hands raised. It's almost certainly a posture of prayer. And remember that the two men are holding up his hands in prayer. And as he holds his hands up in prayer, what happens? Israel is victorious in battle in the valley below. But as his hands get heavy and his hands droop, then what happens? The Amalekites begin to defeat the Israelites. Raise hands, God brings a conquest. Lower his hands, the enemies of God defeat the people of God. So the question is this, where is the battle fought? Where is the battle fought on that day? You can see on one hand, it was fought with the, the sword and with the spear in the valley. It was truly fought there. They needed to fight. But that's not ultimately where the battle was fought, was it? The battle was ultimately fought as Moses, as the leader of God, is crying out to God for his help and mercy for the people of God. That's where the battle is ultimately fought. And as we look at the great needs around us in our families, in our marriages, in our church, throughout our state, throughout our country, we need to recognize that the battle is not fundamentally fought in what we say or in what we do. We do need to say things, we do need to do things, but the battle is ultimately spiritual. The battle is the Lord's, God's word says, and God gives the victory in part as his people give themselves to earnest prayer. How we need to give ourselves to prayer. And, and isn't it true that in the American church today, too often we view prayer as a last resort rather than as a first impulse. It's a last resort rather than a first impulse. But how we ought to give ourselves to prayer. Give yourself to prayer in your prayer closet, with your family, pray with the people of God at the prayer meetings. For us to give ourselves to the work of the Lord without prayer would be like Moses to lower his arms as the battle rages. If we need help, and we do, then we must know that God provides help through prayer. If we want to see God move mightily here in Vermont, and we do, don't we? Then we need to give ourselves to prayer. A second avenue of help is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Verse 19 says, through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing how those are connected here? Prayer and the Spirit of God. We see this often in Scripture. In Acts 2, at Pentecost, the people of God are giving themselves to prayer, and that God pours out His Spirit upon His people. In Acts 4, as the people of God are crying out to God in prayer for boldness, the Spirit of God is given afresh to the people of God to fill them and to empower them. Prayer and the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us what we need to glorify Jesus. The Holy Spirit is referred to in the Bible at, by many terms. He's referred to as our teacher, our interceder, our guide, our helper, our source of power. And Paul knew that the only way that he could glorify Jesus was if the Spirit of Jesus empowered him. And so we need to hear this today as well. We cannot be, expect to be a church that glorifies Jesus in our own power. We can't do it. As the prophet Zechariah says in Zechariah 4, 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It takes a work of the spirit to do anything good, including glorifying Jesus. And we can have confidence that as we walk by the spirit, that he is going to empower us to glorify him. 
The Spirit, God's Word tells us, is given to all believers. And so it's through the Spirit that we have all the resources that we need to glorify Jesus in our lives. So we need help in order to glorify Jesus. And that comes through the prayers of others and through the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, the second truth that I want you to see is a life lived for God's glory, the glory of Christ, it centers on the worth of Christ. The desire to glorify Jesus in verse 20 is explained in verse 21. And this is a passage that I know is a favorite for many of you. Paul says this, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And in the Greek, it's, it's even more sharp, more abrupt. There's actually no verb there. It's just, for to me, Christ, and to die, gain. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's take the first phrase first. For to me to live is Christ. I think to help understand this, let's see how other people might finish this sentence. For to me to live is blank. If someone's aim is to make and acquire wealth in their life, then they would say, for to me to live is money and comfort. If someone is given up to sexual self-gratification, they might say, for to me to live is pleasure. Someone who lives their life to be well-liked by others, they would say, for to me to live is the praise of men. But Paul says here, for to me to live is Christ. Paul's heart cry was that in his life that he might show the great value and worth of Jesus Christ. Paul, Paul is not saying that in some compartment in his life, to me to live is Christ. It's his entire life, every aspect of his life, all that he does, all of his ambitions, Christ is supreme. For Paul, Jesus is the center of the solar system, and everything revolves around Jesus. Life is all about knowing Christ, loving Christ, serving Christ, honoring Christ, obeying Christ, worshiping Christ. And this ought to be the heart cry of every true believer of Christ. We ought to say with Paul, for to me, to live, it's Christ. That's the aim in my life. Whether you're raising your kids, going to work, spending time with your spouse, spending your money, using your time, whatever it might be, we ought to say, for to me to live is that Christ is honored and glorified and made much of in my life. And this kind of life, if we say this, this kind of life glorifies Jesus, doesn't it? Right? Paul's aim is, in my life, whether I live or die, Christ is honored in my body. How's that done when he's alive? Well, for to me to live is Christ. That, that life glorifies Jesus. When we value Jesus above anyone or anything else, that makes much of Jesus. And as you do this, you're going to realize that this is indeed the pathway to joy because Jesus is worth it. If he's not worth it, then you won't find joy in that. But Jesus is worth it, and therefore that's the pathway to joy. Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf, he was a Moravian Christian in the 1700s, and he became gripped with the depth of Christ's love for him when he laid down his life on the cross. And he said this, I have loved him for a long time, but I have never actually done anything for him. From now on, I will do whatever he leads me to do. His attitude was, for to me to live is Christ. And as he was talking to other believers, they became compelled by the need to go bring the gospel to those who had never heard. And so they got on a ship uh, to, to set sail for the West Indies, many of them never to return again. And as they're tearfully saying goodbye to their loved ones and to their family and to their friends, they raised their hands and they said, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. And they were gone. That's an attitude of, for to me to live is Christ. No wonder Paul says in verse 22, he says that if he's to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for him. Paul so valued Christ that if he was delivered from prison, he would devote his life to ministering to other saints, to teaching other saints about Christ, to, to lifting up Christ in all that he said and did. 
If God gave him breath in his lungs, his aim was to live for the glory of Christ. And so young people, I want to give you a challenge. For those of you that are, I don't know, on your 30s on down, I want to give you a challenge. What are you living for? What's the output of your life? If you were to fill in that blank, for to me to live is, how would you answer it? Almost 300 years ago, there was a young 18-year-old man in Connecticut named Jonathan Edwards who penned 70 resolutions, kind of like um, life commitments. And the very first resolution, this 18-year-old man wrote this, resolved that I will do whatsoever I think to be the most to God's glory in the whole of my duration. What a commitment from an 18-year-old young man. I'm resolved that I'm going to do whatever I do to the glory of God. Can you say that that's your resolution, young people? That you want to honor Jesus and live for Jesus and exalt Jesus in all that you say and you do? Do not go on floating on in life with no commitment. Make that your conscious commitment today. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have said that Jesus is your Lord and your Savior, but make that conscious commitment afresh today. Say, Jesus, I want to live for you. And so in my school, in my work, in everything that I do, I want Jesus to be honored and glorified. And I want to give an exhortation for those of you that are in your golden years. The exhortation is this. Brother, sister, finish strong. Finish strong. Paul here, his, he's writing this as an older man. He's almost certainly in his 60s. He has suffered greatly for Christ up to this point here, and yet he's not willing to coast for the rest of his life. He says, if I get out of this prison, then I'm going hard until Christ calls me home. And I know the pressure from your peers is you've lived life, you've worked hard for 40 years, you've labored diligently, cash it all in and coast until you die. But we need to resist that temptation. That's not a biblical temptation. The Bible is clear about how we should think about retirement. And it begins when you die. Whether you have an occupation or not, retirement truly begins when you die. And so, as long as God gives you life, with whatever strength you have, let your heart cry be this, to live is Christ. I want to live faithfully for Christ until he calls me home. And I think we had a great example in our brother John. 86 years old, he was doing whatever he could until God called him home. Let's live faithfully until God calls us home. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Now, how can this be? When we die, we lose everything. We lose our health. That's lost over many years, usually. We lose our loved ones. We lose our bodies. We lose all of our earthly possessions. We lose everything when we die. So how can Paul say, for me to die is gain? Well, the answer is in verse 23. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Losing everything in death is gain because we get to be with Jesus. When we die, our spirit departs from our body and is immediately with Jesus. The Bible does not teach any such thing as purgatory or soul sleep. In 2 Corinthians 5, 8, it says, To be away from the body is to be home with the Lord. Away from the body, you're home with the Lord. And to be united with our blessed Savior is far better than any earthly possession. And these, th these two cries of Paul, they're connected, aren't they? Only those that can truly say, for me to live as Christ, can be able to say, to die as gain. Because if Christ is not honored above all in your life, then when you lose everything in death, you'll view that as a loss and not as a gain. But if Christ is exalted above everything in your life, esteemed above everything in your life, then when you lose everything and you're face to face with Jesus, you say, gain. That's gain. To be with my Lord who loved me and gave himself for, up for me, to be with the Holy Son of God, to be with the one who is the praise and delight of all the angels, to be with the one who is the fountain of all joy and peace and love and blessedness, to be with him, that's gain. John Newton, who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, this is what he said. What countless multitudes have gone before us in the path that leads to that kingdom. 
They were in their time followers of an unseen savior, as we are now. But now that they see him as he is, face to face in all of his glory and in all of his love, with them are joined the innumerable host of angels. Angels and saints, however, however distinguished, are joined in one happiness and one employment. Even now, while I write and while you read and while we're here today, they are praising the lamb that was slain and casting their crowns at his feet. Chuck, I think one of your favorite hymns is Face to Face, isn't it? You always reference that one. Face to Face, believed by Fanny Crosby, wasn't it? I think so. Face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ who died for me. Face to face I shall behold him, far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory I shall see him by and by. Paul concludes this section in verses 24 to 26. He says that he believes it's far better to go to heaven, but he believes that God still has work for him to do on earth. It's more necessary, he says, that he remains to keep working for their progress and joy of the Philippians' faith. Why? It's also that Paul, in Paul, the Philippians would, would give glory to Christ Jesus. And as it turns out, Paul, he was indeed released from prison. He lived another about two or three years longer, where he was imprisoned again by Caesar, and then he was beheaded and with his Savior. So brothers and sisters, you have been called to live for Jesus. You are surrounded by many idolatrous and worthless reasons in our culture to live your life, but they are all empty. There is no one more glorious, more awesome, more worthy of your life than Jesus. He is the one who created you, and he's the one who sustains you. He is Lord, and you are accountable to Jesus. And you will all stand before Jesus. And if you are a believer, then he is the one who purchased you with his own precious blood on the cross. He forgave you of all of your sins. Through his work, you're reconciled to God the Father. And he has given you his Holy Spirit to produce new life within you. He is the Son of God who is worthy of your all. So will you not say with the Apostle Paul afresh today, truly, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Let's pray. So, Father, I pray that you would give us eyes to see Christ. I pray for those that are here today that they, that they do not know you, that they do not have a living faith in Christ Jesus, that perhaps these things seem strange to them. But I pray that they would recognize that Christ is Lord, that they would also see the love of Christ, that Christ laid down his life for sinners. And I pray, Father, that you might even draw them to yourself today, that they might repent of their sins and turn in saving faith to Christ. And Father, I pray that all of us would see more of the worth of Christ. Pray, Father, in the, the struggles, the challenges, the trials that we have, it's so easy for us to focus on other things. I think this is the solution, and we can be detracted from Christ. And so, Father, I pray that you would reorient us today, that you'd be reminded, that we would be reminded of our own mortality, and that we would be able to say, life is short, we've been redeemed by Christ, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So grant us that grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.